It's, it's a pleasure to be here and have a chance to talk with you about some of the work that I and my um, collaborators and students have been doing uh, over the last a number of decades. Uh, and the talk I've been giving lately is called uh, The Memory Factory. So I s I've been very interested in memories and false memories, how people come to believe and remember that they saw things differently than they really happened or that they even saw entire events that didn't happen. And over the course of my years of working on these problems, I've developed a few paradigms for studying memory. One of them is now called the misinformation paradigm. And what happens to subjects, and this is our attempt to kind of simulate what goes on in a real uh, crime type situation or accident type situation, we'll show people an event, a simulated crime or accident, we'll expose them to some post-event information, some new information about the event, ostensibly coming from some other individual, and then we'll test our subjects to see what it is they remember. And, and so in one of the oldest studies that I did that's still described in a number of introductory psychology textbooks, we showed people a simulated accident, and after the accident, we asked a leading question, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? And we found that our subjects estimated the speed of the vehicles as higher than a more neutral question, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? But that leading smash question did even more. Because when you came back to these witnesses a week later and asked them a new question like, did you see any broken glass, those to whom we had asked the smash question were now far more likely to say that they had seen broken glass that didn't exist relative to the more neutral question. Uh, in a, a subsequent experiment, we showed people a simulated accident where a car went through an intersection with a stop sign, and by asking a single leading question that suggested it was a yield sign, we convinced lots and lots of our subject witnesses that they'd seen a yield sign at the intersection, not a stop sign. And in a study that we published uh, just last year, we used a very unusual group of subjects soldiers who are learning what it's going to be like for them if they are ever captured as prisoners of war. They're, they're undergoing a survival school experience, and during this experience, they are interrogated in an aggressive, hostile, physically abusive way for a half hour, and later on, they have to identify the person who conducted that interrogation, and we found that with a little misinformation, we could get lots and lots of people to misidentify the perpetrator, often identifying somebody who didn't even remotely resemble him. And so now I've given you a little primer on something called the misinformation effect. If you expose people to misinformation about a crime, about an accident, about an everyday ordinary event that they might have experienced, it has the potential to contaminate, transform, or distort their memory. And out there in the real world, misinformation is everywhere. We pick up misinformation when we talk to other witnesses who might have been present at the scene of a crime or accident, when we're interrogated in suggestive or leading ways, when we uh, turn on the television or read a newspaper article about some event, maybe a high publicity event, that we might have witnessed, all of these provide the opportunity for new information to become available and to potentially contaminate somebody's memory. In the 1990s, uh, I began to notice an even more extreme form of memory problem. Some people were going into therapy with one kind of problem, they had an eating disorder. Maybe they were depressed. Maybe they were uh, just less interested in life. And they were coming out of therapy with a different problem, horrific memories of abuse, sometimes claiming they were raped for a decade, sometimes claiming they were raped in satanic rituals, forced into animal sacrifice, baby breeding, baby sacrifice, the works. And one of the things, you know, that it was natural to ask is, 
where are these bizarre memories coming from? And one of the things that we began to notice is that many of these individuals had been in a certain kind of psychotherapy. And so we asked, were some of the things going on in this psychotherapy leading these individuals to have these bizarre memories like guided imagination or dream interpretation or hypnosis or exposure to false memories. And so we began to fi try to figure out how could we design some studies that ex could explore the potential for these processes or, the, or these manipulations, even inadvertent manipulations, to lead people to false memories. That's when we developed a new paradigm. And we now call this the rich false memory paradigm. In this scientific work, there's no event to begin with. But we ply people with suggestions about their past, and then we come back to them later and we ask them questions about the past, about their childhood or about their more recent past. So the first study that we did on this, using this rich false memory paradigm, trying to think of something that we could plant in the minds of people that would have been at least mildly traumatic if it had happened, but wouldn't be so traumatic it would have upset our experimental subjects, we suggested to subjects that when they were a kid, five or six years old, they were lost in a shopping mall. They were frightened, crying, and ultimately they were rescued by an elderly person reunited with the family. And by the time we were done with three suggestive interviews, we'd convinced a quarter of our sample of ordinary adults that they'd had this experience that we'd made up. Critics came back, they said, you know, getting lost is so common. Uh, if you're gonna talk about uh, this on the same page, in the same paragraph, as you're talking about memories for satanic ritual abuse, at least show us you can plant a false memory for something that would be a little more upsetting or bizarre or unusual. And other investigators, and we ourselves, did these studies. Planting a rich false memory that when you were a kid, you nearly drowned and had to be rescued by a lifeguard. This was a study done at the University of Tennessee. They succeeded with about a third of their adults. And in a study done in Canada, they planted a false memory that something as awful as being attacked by a vicious animal happened to you when you were a child, succeeding with about half of their subjects. And in a study done in Italy, planted a false memory that you witnessed a person being demonically possessed. So these rich false memories could be planted in the minds of ordinary people. When I came to UCI and began, continued this research, I got very interested in the consequences of a false memory. So if I plant a false memory in you, does it have repercussions? Does it affect your later thoughts, your later intentions, your later behaviors? And with my graduate students and postdoc, we planted false memories that you got sick eating particular foods, dill pickles, strawberry ice cream, and we found that we could affect not only your thoughts about the particular food, but what you actually ate when we put food in front of you. Now these false memories aren't necessarily bad. We also found that we could plant a false memory uh, a warm, fuzzy memory of a healthy food. We did this with asparagus, and you want to eat more asparagus. <laughs> and just last year, we planted false memory. We published a study where we succeeded in planting false memories that you got sick on vodka as a teenager, and people don't want vodka as much. I uh, find this manipulation doesn't work on me, but it does <laughs> wor work on uh, uh, our experimental subjects. So. Uh, along with this uh, ability to plant false memories and to control people's behavior comes a number of ethical dilemmas uh, for our society, such as when should we use this mind technology and should we ever ban its use? Well, I've been working on problems of memory and memory distortion for many decades now. And I do have to say that the one take home lesson that I've learned is this. Just because somebody tells you something with confidence, just because they describe it in a lot of detail, 
Just because they express it with a lot of emotion, it doesn't mean that it really happened. You need independent corroboration to know whether a memory is authentic or whether it's a product of some other process. And such a discovery uh, might have helped to save the hundreds and hundreds of innocent people who have been convicted of crimes that they did not do. And we now know that faulty human memory is the major cause of those convictions. So I'll leave you with one last message. If I've learned anything, memory, like liberty, is a fragile thing. Thank you.